Hey, greetings, everybody. Welcome back to Patriot to the Core podcast. I am Thad Forrester. This is episode number 59. Uh, on June 23rd, 2018, a team of 12 boys who were all between the ages of 11 and 16 had just finished a weekly soccer practice and went to explore a cave with their coach. But after they'd entered the cave, heavy rain started falling and the rising water trapped them inside. One day later, their belongings were found, like their bikes and some flip-flops and shoes. Uh, Then on July 2nd, a rescue diver discovered them when he ran out of line and popped up out of the water inside the cave. While most of the world was captivated by this story, my guest today was in the thick of the action. Major Charles Hodges was the U.S. Mission Commander of Ground Forces, brought in from the 353rd Special Operations Unit to advise and assist the Royal Thai government. Today, he gives us great detail on their initial thought processes, how he and his team helped lead the multinational effort, and had to end up being bold with the Thai government because they had no choice but to get the wild boars out of there. Regardless that, Major Hodges believed that three to five of the boys could die in the process. Major Hodges, an Air Force combat controller, concluded with this, this is what we train for, going into a crisis and solving problems. I think you will really enjoy this episode. I loved talking with him. He was very nice and even worked with me while he was uh, in the hospital with his young son, who's been in there for a few weeks. So let's get into Major Charles Hodges. All right, so Major Charles, will you explain what role you played in the rescue of the soccer team? Yeah, so I was the mission commander. So I was the the ground force commander, and I was charged in charge of all of the uh, the military response. So all the Air Force personnel that were sent from the 353rd Special Operations Group in Okinawa, I was in charge of all of them. Why were you chosen? Was it was it location, experience, and it was uh, it was mostly location. So real briefly, the the Royal Thai government sent out a request to the U.S. government looking for assistance in this rescue mission, and that went to the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command in Hawaii, which passed it to the Special Operations Command Pacific, also in Hawaii, that passed it to the 353rd Special Operations Group here at Okinawa, and all of that happened in a matter of minutes or hours uh, passing, and then we had a what was called a crisis action team. So basically all the senior leaders in the group came together and we got as much information as we could at the time. And Colonel Kirby, the 353rd SOG commander, knew that we have a team that's on alert at all times, a special tactics team that's on alert, and basically turned to me and said, okay, we need to uh, deploy these guys. I want a field grade officer uh, with them. Uh, I was the only field grade officer and... So I was the one that was appointed as the the mission commander for this. So which uh, is not uncommon, and since we do have an alert team that's always ready to go, that's prepped for humanitarian assistance, disaster relief type things, such as this event, uh, we were ready to go. So we already had guys that you know when they're on alert, they're not allowed to take leave off the island, and we've always got a their kit ready to go and posture to blow out, and so we were ready and willing to go for something like this. Had you taken part in any other, any aid missions like this, whether it's Katrina or maybe somewhere else in the world? No, I hadn't. Uh, so this was new to me. Some of the guys that were with me had done something like this, but we approach these humanitarian assistance missions very similarly to the way that we approach our military missions from a mission planning perspective and task organization and just from problem solving perspective. And so while I hadn't necessarily done something like this, we were still able to apply the tools that we normally apply to it. So, I mean, obviously there's some different things you're working with civilian agencies, you're working with international agencies that you wouldn't be working with, say, if you were in Afghanistan or Iraq, but in many ways it was uh, similar. All right, so you had you heard about them before you were ever even tasked to go? Uh, I'd heard one or two snippets of news about them. Uh, they went missing uh, on Saturday, 
and we were notified Wednesday morning. And in that short time frame, I'd seen one or two uh, little things about it, but honestly, I hadn't paid a whole lot of attention to it. I thought, oh, man, that's a tough situation for those kids. I hope they get out. And that was about the amount of attention that I had paid to it. Mm -hmm. What went through your head, you know, once you got there, what are some immediate steps that you took or maybe some and some people you thought of that, that you could pull in as a resource. What are some of the early things you did? Well, so we got there to Chiang Rai, the major international airport in northern Thailand, about 1 o'clock in the morning on the 28th of June. So that was very early in the morning on, on a Thursday. And I took my key leaders with me directly to the cave. We spent uh, so we sent most of the guys uh, to where we were lodging at a hotel, and I said, hey, you know, you guys go get some rest. We're going to, because we'd already been up at that point, uh, close to 24 hours, just prepping and flying and, and all that. And I said, you guys go get some rest. We're going to go and go to the cave, and we're going to figure out what's going on, just get an initial assessment, uh, a leader's recon, so to speak. And we showed up, got there about 2 o'clock in the morning, immediately went in, and we were doing our best to gather as much information as we could because we didn't have a whole lot of information. I mean, once you go underground in the cave, there's there's not real clear surveys that are available to a lot of folks. The conditions in the cave were uh, unknown, and everyone had told us that they can change very quickly. And so we went in, and we were the escort that was with us took us down to the mouth of the cave. When I say the mouth of the cave, you're probably... 75 to 100 meters in the cave, but you're still inside the mouth. You can still see daylight coming from outside. And that's probably 20 meters down. So you're already down, you're looking up, you're seeing the light, but it's kind of a, a big open area. It's a, it's a safe point at that, at that location. Mm -hmm. And he walked us from that point about another 50 to 75 meters into the cave. And as soon as you go past some of the big boulders that are inside or past some of the the passages, light is immediately gone. Uh, and so it's already pitch black 50 meters in, 75 meters in. And if you don't have your headlamp with you, you're not really seeing anything at all. Um, thankfully, we had our headlamps with us. And he was pointing up and showing us, hey, this chamber that we're in right now, the ceiling is about... 25 feet up or so and he pointed to a mark about 20 feet up on the side and said you know there's the mud line up there you can see that at one point in time it's at least been flooded up to that level and while we're standing there looking at it thinking wow that's that's pretty wild that this whole chamber has been flooded in the past up to 20 feet we're, we're standing here and it's relatively dry where we're at right now but we could be 20 feet underwater at this point, we hear some shouts from the mouth of the cave saying, hey, get back here. And we didn't really know why and really didn't care. We continued talking to the guy that was escorting us back there for another couple minutes. And then we heard people shouting more urgently saying, hey, get back to the mouth of the cave. Now it's starting to flood. And we're looking around and think, oh, we really don't see any flooding, but sure, we'll go back to the mouth of the cave. And so we start going back to the mouth of the cave and you know, it's still dark and also it takes a little bit of time, a minute or two to walk from the those 50 to 75 meters back out to the mouth of the cave. And sure enough, we get out there and there is water flowing in at a pretty good rate. And there's standing water now all in the mouth of the cave. And we stand there another few minutes and uh, within five minutes or so, there's standing water that's ankle deep in an area that's 1500 square feet or so and so we realized in about a five minute period an entire house sized uh, area of the cave can get flooded up to an ankle deep and there can be no obvious indicators no sounds of rushing water no no wind moving through the cave no visible change in some of the standing water that's there in the cave and so we realized wow this this the atmospheric conditions the environment can absolutely change really quick in this cave structure and so we went uh, out of the cave and it's still you know it's 1 30 in the morning or so uh, i'm sorry it's probably 2 30 in the morning or so at this point 
And we found a building that was kind of on site. Understand this is all in a Thai national forest type environment. So it's mostly jungle type area. There's not a whole lot of uh, buildings around. But one of the buildings that's there on site has a, a room with a table in it. And we all gathered around. And we just started brainstorming. And we realized, you know. Is this just not- you and your team and then one Thai representative? Yep, right now this is just me and five or six of my uh, key leaders. So my senior enlisted advisor, my special tactics team leader, the element leaders that were there, uh, and then uh, one of the representatives, one of the U.S. Army representatives that is in uh, Thailand full-time as a kind of a liaison. He was there as well. And so we we realized Hey, you know what? We, uh, you know, we're not cave rescue specialists. We're absolutely rescue specialists and and medical experts, specifically trauma medicine and battlefield uh, care. But we didn't have any visor, visions of grandeur that we knew anything more than what the Thai already knew, and the Thai had already been trying to find ways to get back into the cave. But we thought, okay, let's start from square one. Let's see what we think is a logical approach to this, then we'll figure out. And at this point in time, we really haven't talked to a whole lot of the Thai authorities, but we'll brainstorm. And if our goal, if our role here is to advise and assist uh, the Thai, then we'll, we need to come up with our plan and then we'll see what, what they're doing and we'll come alongside them where we think makes the most sense. And so we just started brainstorming ideas of, and understand the kids have not been found at this point. Mm -hmm. So, we don't even know. We are assuming, like everyone else, that they are in the cave. Their bicycles were locked to the guardrail going down into the mouth of the cave. Uh, we knew that some personal items, like some flip-flops and clothes, had been found further into the cave. But no one was positive that they were there. Everyone's making that assumption because they've looked everywhere else in the town and search parties had been, had gone out to the hills around the cave. And all we knew is at one point in time, they had been in the mouth of the cave and they had locked their bikes up there. And from there, uh, personal effects were found in farther into the cave. So everyone's making the assumption they're in there somewhere. So our first goal was we needed to get proof of life. And then, from that point, we could determine whether or not this was going to be a rescue mission or a recovery mission. And so all of our efforts at point are, are centering around how do we get into the cave to determine if these kids and this coach are even alive. And we kind of went along after about an hour long brainstorming session. We came up with a four parallel lines of effort because we're thinking who has the best experience worldwide, who has the best knowledge base for digging deep into the ground and finding pockets that they are looking for, whether that's uh, dry pockets or wet pockets or any sort of liquid, and then pumping that out because we knew that we needed to get into the cave and the water was what was stopping us from getting into the cave. So who has a lot of knowledge in digging deep into the ground and pumping out massive amounts of liquid? Well, that's oil and gas companies. And so we immediately started thinking, okay, we need to contact an Exxon or a Mobile or Chevron or the Thai equivalent of that, which is a PTT is the the Thai equivalent of that. We need to contact one of those guys and just start these massive drilling and pumping efforts. Um, So that was one thing. We also knew that we needed to just start pumping straight from the mouth of the cave. So that wouldn't necessarily require us to contact an oil and gas company, but just bringing in pumps that could start pumping from where the water was flowing out of the mouth of the cave. So that was uh, number two. Another thing was like, well, everybody tells us the only way in and out and only uh, into this cave is the mouth of it, but this cave system runs for at least 10 kilometers or so. There might be other access points. And did you have maps, or how did you know that? Uh, So there was a map done by a French spelunking society in the late 80s and we were able to get our hands on that later on we realized that there was a uh, a uk expat that spent a good bit of his time in 
Maysai, the town just outside of the Tom Luong Cave Complex, and his personal hobby, his personal obsession was exploring this cave and mapping it out. And so later we found that he had taken the surveys to the next level, but initially all we had were these surveys done by a French uh, spelunking organization back in the late 80s. And understand, cave surveys and the technology to do them are still things like a map and compass and bearing and counting paces because GPS doesn't work uh, underground because you can't read off the satellite. So the way they do these surveys is they'll do distance and bearing from a known point. So at the mouth of the cave, you've got a very defined known point with latitude and longitude, and then you point your compass at the direction that you... uh, the cave goes, and then you count off number of paces and measure from there, and you, when you get to a turn, you do the same thing, and you keep on doing that over and over. And so you can get pretty accurate surveys from that, but if any of those points are erroneous along the way, then it throws everything else off as yeah. well. So it's not nearly as uh, accurate as, say, a GPS survey that's done above ground. So, yes, we had those, but it wasn't uh, the accuracy of those was in question. So, and they also didn't go as far down as we thought we might needed to go to get the kids. Mm -hmm. So, there was the pumping efforts, there was the drilling efforts, there was the send everybody into the mountains and try to find alternative access points uh, efforts. And we did that with some of the Thai special forces that were there, where they would send out hundreds of guys into the ridgeline and just scanning for holes that could possibly go into the cave system. And when you're in a double or triple canopy jungle where visibility on the ground may not extend more than 20 feet or so, that was a very hard thing to do. So you couldn't just send one or two guys uh, walking along the way. You had to send a whole string of guys that covered literally every square meter to see if there was alternative access points. And we found a lot that were promising, as in it would look like the entrance to a cave, it would look like you could go in maybe 10, 15, maybe 20 or 30 meters or more, but then they would just stop and you couldn't get any farther in. Hmm. So that was that was line of effort number three. And then the last one was diving and going in and going against the flow of water upstream to try to find these kids. And so as we're there that first day, and th- those are the four things that we identify. Uh, we start task organizing our guys to to uh, go and work on each of those four lines of effort. And as the days progress, as the weeks progress, and understand this is still before we found the kids, it becomes clear to us that some of these are not very viable options. So trying to find these alternative access points all the locals that were there, all the experts that were there uh, when it came to this cave, they all said there there is no alternative access point. We've been looking for it for years, and sure enough, we never could find any. We even uh, were able to get one of the Thai helicopters, and we did aerial reconnaissance by flying up and down the, the ridgeline and just looking as best we could, thinking that if we could get in the air and just be – 50 to 100 feet above the the ground there, we could look down and and see and cover a whole lot more ground quicker than all the foot patrols that were there. But unfortunately, we were never able to find anything. And then when it came to drilling down and trying to uh, see if there's a way, another way we could get into the cave system, the way we did that was we connected with some Thai civilian ground mapping agencies that would bring in equipment along the lines of a ground mapping radar and they would lay out these electronic leads that were anywhere from 100 to 200 meters long and they would lay those out along the ground they would hit the button on the machine to make it send out the electric pulse and what would come back would be a result of what type ground was underneath where they laid out the those (laughs) electronic leads And the whole idea was if we can find areas where the distance from the surface of the ground 
down to the ceiling of an interior chamber was a relatively short distance, then we might be able to drill in there, slip down a light, slip down a microphone or a radio or some sort of camera and try to get proof of life or at least proof that maybe there's, there's bodies inside. Uh, So our guys were helping them lay out those and understand moving through this jungle and trying to lay out all these uh, electronic leads was incredibly difficult, incredibly time consuming. And even after they did all that, it was determined that the, the shortest point from the surface of the ground down to the roof of an interior chamber was about 200 meters. And so still, even though that was the, the, the shortest, the narrowest, or we'll say the most shallow uh, place to get into the cave, it would have taken about two days just to do the drilling through the limestone to get a four to six inch borehole. And that was assuming that we could get the drilling equipment on top of the mountain to drill from those locations. So, and the only way to get the drilling equipment on top was to clear a helicopter landing zone and helicopter in some of this drilling equipment. And so you're talking about massive efforts. And, and we did that. We we helped the, the Thai Special Forces Regiment clear two separate locations that we identified as having potential to get down into the cave. Uh, and, it, you know, it took a couple days to clear a landing, a helicopter landing zone large enough to bring in this uh, drilling equipment. And, they ended up bringing the drilling equipment in, but uh, thankfully during that time frame was when the children was, were found. But even if we had brought that in, we realized this is not a feasible option either. It's going to take us a day and a half, two days minimum to drill through this 200 meters of limestone. When we do, we're only going to have a four to six inch hole going down. And then if we can even determine proof of life, we're then going to have to drill at least an 18-inch hole to slide a rescuer down to help pull these kids mm-hmm. out. So we knew that that wasn't necessarily a feasible option. Uh, you know, that worked for the Chilean rescue, which I think was in 2012. But in the Chilean rescue, they weren't in the same type of environment. They had more air. They were not surrounded by water, um, and they were able to get food down to them. And it took them two months to drill down to them. We knew that we didn't have the time to do that based off of the monsoon rains that were coming. So that option kind of fell off the table. The other option of the pumping, we knew that we had to keep doing that. And so Chevron brought in some experts and some other petroleum and gas company and water pumping experts brought in some uh, technical advisors, brought in the pumps, brought in larger pipes and they just started pumping nonstop. And and to give you an idea of how massive of an effort this was, they didn't just pump water out of the chambers towards the mouth of the cave where they were able to get pumps in or where they were able to put pipes into. They also drilled into the water table surrounding the area and put hoses down there and pumped water out, and they literally were doing their best, and they were successful in it, in lowering the entire water table in the wow. region. And I mean, were they just, <laughs> was it just flowing out just to the surrounding land? The yep, unfortunately or? it was uh, it was flowing out. and um, So it's odd that the cave system was inside of a mountain system. So the cave system was actually higher up than the surrounding uh, area, mm-hmm. uh, the town, but overall, the cave system was at the bottom of a watershed. So I know that sounds contradictory, but any time that water rained within a 50-mile radius, it would have an impact on the water levels inside the cave because kind of on a macro scale, it was towards the bottom of a watershed. But on a micro scale, it was in a higher area than the town that was around them. And so as they're doing all this pumping – there were literally hundreds of rice farms in the area. They got flooded, and those farmers, uh, they lost their crops. Mm. So that didn't make the news a whole lot, but uh, in, in my mind, it was a it was a challenge to work through. Uh, USAID, I know, came in and helped to subsidize some of those rice farmers uh, because of the cr- 
crops that they were losing. And they kind of willingly endured that burden, knowing that these kids were getting rescued. But it was still something. It's still a challenge that I know that the local tie will be working through for probably a couple of years. Yeah. So, but with all that in mind, we, the conditions quickly started to tell us the only option available to us now is we've got to dive in there and we've got to, to find these kids. And as we're coming to that conclusion, that's when the UK divers, uh, Rick Stanton and John Volenthin, they were able to make their way all the way back to where the kids were and they found them. And, uh, that was, that was huge. I believe it was, it was, uh, pretty sure it was the night of July 2nd, might be July 3rd. Dates kind of run together in July my mind. July 2nd is what was reported anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was really late on the night of July 2nd. And, uh, that was huge. That was, uh, just, uh, awesome. So Charles, when, when, <laughs> when, um, the UK divers found them, did they, first of all, are these the two guys that were, well, shoot, you've been on so many news outlets, but either 2020 or Dateline did a great special a few weeks ago and they talked to, were they the two that they talked to? Nope. That was, uh, Chris Jewell and Jason Mallinson, uh, Rick and John, um, a little more private individuals, and uh, I don't think they were interested in uh, in being interviewed. Okay. So, but uh, those guys were absolute rock stars in my mind. They knew exactly what they were doing, and uh, you know they're not they're not military. Rick was a retired firefighter, uh, so definitely had the the first responder mentality. Um, John was not, but both those guys had the right mental mindset that I would have worked with those guys any day. Well, how did they when they went went in there? Did they go ahead and start? attaching the rope for the for the tethering for later on or did they just and how did they you know some of those those areas were very tight so did they already have the proper gear or did they did they just take it off as they went and it was it uh, they found them first try or, or what yes and no so when it was there, when it was initially identified that the boys were missing and assistance was called in to try to find them the Royal Thai Navy SEALs were some of the first that came in. And at that point, <clears throat> you could get all the way back to the T-junction without needing to be on compressed air. It was just, I won't say it was going through a totally dry cave, but it was, for the most part, dry. And so when they first arrived on scene and they were looking for the kids, they knew, just like all other cavers knew, you need to have a a guide rope in there. So they started setting a guide rope from the T-junction towards where they were looking, whether that was to the north or, or to the south. But then some of the rain started coming, and the cave system got flooded, and they had to exfil the cave. And it wasn't until later that we realized, oh, nobody ran any guidelines all the way up to Chamber 6 because you could just walk it previously. So it was almost as if when Rick and John came on the scene and they started to try to find their things, try to find the kids, they weren't starting from square one. They were starting from square minus six. And so they had to start laying new lines all the way starting from the cave mouth going back there. And another challenge was the water flow wasn't that bad starting out, but it kept on getting worse and worse. And so the lines that were originally laid were – small diameter lines think uh, parachute cord 550 cord mm-hmm. but if you are going to use that line to try to find your way through uh, a, cha- a cave system that has a massive amount of water coming towards you you can't hang on to parachute cord and pull your way through you definitely need a higher diameter cord like a eight millimeter to ten millimeter rope think like a climbing rope and so they had to lay new line all the way from the start back there. And that's what Rick and John were doing is they were laying this new line. Of course, they're looking for the kids at the same time, but they weren't going to go wisely. So they weren't going to go anywhere without uh, having a higher diameter rope laid back there. So they were laying this line out there and they got to uh, where the previous day's line was able to get, which was about back to chamber six or that T 
at T Junction, and then as they're going south, they were laying more line. And when that line ran out, was basically where they came up out of the water and they stopped and they looked around and that's where the kids were. And so it was, you know, divine intervention that the rope stopped exactly because otherwise they claim, well, we would have just kept on going underwater with it and we wouldn't have had a reason to come up at that point. And it's possible that they could have missed the kids. Wow. But yeah, so pretty incredible story. What did they tell you the reaction of the kids was when they first saw them? Their reaction was uh, surprise, like, whoa, this is crazy. These, these kids are here, and they immediately start counting, and they got 13. And they're like, well, are all 13 of you here? Yes. And then the kids' reaction is what you see on the videos, which is just this very serene type reaction, <laughs> very polite. I'm not sure that I would have been as calm as they were. I would have probably have been whooping and hollering, and uh, but they uh, – they're very polite. There's the one boy, Abdul, that spoke a little bit of English, and they were able to communicate that they were there. They were all healthy. No one was injured. Uh, obviously, they were ready to get out. And some of the first questions that they were asking Rick and John were along the lines of, who's winning the World Cup? Because they'd been in this cave for about nine or ten days at this point, and they hadn't seen any of the World Cup, and they're all interested in who was winning. So that tells me that the kids were <laughs> obviously more resilient than we probably give them credit for. Yeah. Well, what were conditions like, though? This is probably reported. I didn't really see in all the details. But, I mean, was it cold in there? They obviously just had on shorts, you know, and T-shirts. And, and then what about sanitary conditions? Yeah, so you're in a, a tropical region. The conditions outside the cave, at the cave mouth, in at the end of June, early July, are hot and humid, anywhere probably from 80 to 86 or 87 degrees Fahrenheit during the day with 85 plus percent humidity with rains in the afternoon often. So the kids were wearing their sports clothes. They were wearing shorts, t-shirt, and flip-flops. When you get down into the cave, though, the conditions are a little more temperate and probably a little more steady, but still at least probably uh, 75 to 80 degrees there. But then the water temperature was definitely much cooler. So there's two waters. If you, if you know the layout of the cave and how it runs basically east to west from the mouth of the cave back to the T-intersection, and then at the T-intersection, the cave series runs north and south. That series to the north is called the Monk Series, and there's two sources of water for it, and both of them are underground sources. It hasn't been found out yet if it's an underground river or an underground spring. Some of the experts think it comes all the way in from Burma, and that water is cold. The water that comes out of the southern series that flows north up to the T intersection and then out of the mouth mostly comes from the watershed and water runoff. So the water there is from the rain, and it's a little bit warmer. Uh, but at the same time, if those kids are in the water, say more than an hour, and you see how little body fat those kids have, uh, it was a significant issue for them. And that's why we made sure that before these kids were pulled out, that we had wetsuits for them with hoods and gloves so that they could conserve a little bit of their body heat. For the Thai Navy SEALs that were going in, uh, when they were in there for more than an hour, and those guys also had really low levels of body fat, they were coming out and they were shivering pretty good. And these are grown men that are moving throughout the, the whole time that they're there. So for these kids, it was a, it was a pretty significant risk that uh, was being taken to have them underwater for hour, two hours, three hours at a time. Was there any way to communicate with walkie-talkies, radios at all? Uh not really. Not. Um, yeah. I mean, within some of these chambers were 100 yards long or more, but for the most part, there wasn't really any way to communicate other than yelling back and forth and hand and arm signals. So, in my mind, the the Royal Thai Navy SEALs were pure geniuses in that they had a Vietnam era field telephone that ran from their op center outside the cave mouth all the way to Chamber Three. So, I mean, it's as reliable as a hammer. And about as complex, but it was functional and it worked well. 
and it didn't matter if it ran through the mud or ran through the water, it would get there. So they had point-to-point communication from Chamber 3 back to the Ops Center outside. And at first I thought it was frivolous, but they also ran a, uh, a cable back to Chamber 3, so they had wireless inside Chamber 3. And at first I thought, you know, why are they wasting their efforts on this? But it turned out to be really good because when we actually started doing the rescue mission, it was really helpful to have that there. And we could send text back and forth to our guys that were in the cave through WhatsApp. Even though they didn't have cell phone reception, they could get wireless and we could send messages and and call them back and forth from there. So that was really good. But there was no communications within Chamber 1 or 2, and there's no uh, no communications past Chamber 3. So what that meant is we had to be very thorough in our planning process because once those guys went past Chamber 3, there's no way that the command and control element could really assist them until they were done with their mission. So it was kind of like you hit the play button, and then you just let it play out. So we had to be really thorough in our planning to make sure that everybody knew what the mission was, how they were supposed to do it, all the branch contingency plans that could happen, you know, all the timelines. So if they go out and they don't come back by a certain period of time, now we're going to go in and, you know, rescue the rescuers. So it was uh, it was challenging from that standpoint, but from a mission control standpoint, it was kind of neat. Like, this is exactly the way it's supposed to work. You just plan it, and then everybody goes and executes it, and you just kind of sit back and, and wait for things to happen. So in some ways it was reactive, but it was only because we had been pro- so proactive in the planning process. How long did it take once they had found the way to the kids? How long would it take one of the divers to swim from the mouth or wherever they started all the way to where the kids are located? And and that's just by themselves. And then how much time was added to that journey once they were they had a child with them? So I can't give you a clear answer on that because it's all dependent on the skill level of the divers. So Rick and John... They were able to, Rick and John and Jason and Chris, the the four main UK divers that did this, they were able to get back to Chamber 9 in an hour and a half or so. Coming back with the kids, it would depend on how big the kids were and conditions constantly changing within the cave, but it could take them up to three hours to get one of the kids back. Wow. For the the Navy SEALs that went back there, uh, good, competent soldiers, but not necessarily highly skilled cave rescue divers, when they sent some guys back there, it took them five hours to get back there. And then it took them about the same time to come out. And they were not bringing kids out with them. So it's very dependent on uh, skill level, but it's also dependent on the type of equipment that they had. Rick and John had specific cave diving equipment where they had side-mounted rigs that cause you to have a lower uh, profile going through some of the restrictions within the cave, but the Thai SEALs had standard back-mounted rigs that you either have to take them off and go through the small restrictions, or you're just not getting through it. Uh, so it was very dependent on... claustrophobia yeah. just thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these guys, uh, they're pretty good at pushing aside the, uh, the emotional factor and just say, hey, this is my mission. As long as I'm breathing compressed air, I can take my rig off and keep my regulator in my mouth and mm-hmm. push it through the hole, and then I'll follow through the hole after it. So it was, uh, yeah, not something for the faint of heart. <laughs> so how did you, you're, you're a father, and I guess it doesn't matter, but, I, you know, but since I am too, I think of my kids in there. And I mean, how did you handle this emotionally? Because you had a job to do, you had to stay focused, and... You know, as a leader, you can alter the morale, I guess, or you have an impact on the morale of, of the group. So, I mean, how did you handle staying focused and maybe not getting too emotionally attached to the situation? Yeah, so we knew that we would need to manage our expectations in that realm. And we knew that our mission was a we, – we were given a tasking order to advise and assist the royal Thai government. And – we knew that we would not be able to advise and assist in a dispassionate, logical way if we let our emotions get too involved in this. And so we absolutely discussed this before we uh, arrived on scene. And 
yeah, I've got four kids and probably half the guys that were on the rescue mission have kids as well. And I don't want it to sound like we were not emotionally invested in this because we absolutely were. But we knew that if we were going to be a benefit to the tithe, then we couldn't let this become an emotionally driven mission. We had to approach it strictly from a logical standpoint. We had to have clear risk analysis based off of factors that were present and observable, not based off of factors that were emotionally driven or fear driven or even pride driven at times. We had to just uh, go off the facts. And I think that was very helpful because there were competing plans for how to deal with the kids back there. But when we were finally called to brief the minister of the interior, before we ever briefed him on our plan, I probably laid out for five or ten minutes just the background for how we got there to explain to him, hey, sir, we are absolutely wanting to help the Thai people and help these children and the coach. But we have focused on this strictly as an outsider looking in, and we have only tried to make logical decisions, not emotional decisions, because once you get too emotional, we can't, uh, you can't make logic-based decisions. And I think they appreciated that because many of the Thai were too close to it emotionally. They knew that this was going to be a challenge for them to do. They wanted a zero-risk option. The, the governor specifically said, we will not do anything that's not a zero-risk option. And I had to flat out tell him, hey, sir, there, there is no zero-risk option. We have the option of saving some, maybe all of them, or we have the option of letting them sit there for the next four or five months, and I can pretty much tell you they're all going to die. Uh, and I think when we were that blunt about it, it dawned on them, yes, this truly is the situation, this truly is the case, and they were willing to accept it, but it was easier for them to hear it from an outsider that was a little more disconnected than they were. Yeah. Was this all going through an interpreter? Uh, for some of it, it was. Some of it, was, it, were, it was not. Uh, anything that I had to go, uh, that I had to communicate to a Thai speaker only was through an interpreter because I have zero Thai skills. <laughs> but plenty of the uh, senior leaders in the Thai uh, leadership realm, they have decent English. Okay. So. Yeah. Well, I'm going to read a quote by you. Of course, you can tell me if this is really accurate or not, but I, I think it is. You know, <laughs> One of the many quotes by you in the news, and it says, uh, this is when you had said, I believe you said we were fully expecting casualties. And then yeah. to follow along with that, you said, we also understood, though, we didn't have the option to attempt this. Uh, we didn't have the option to not attempt this, even though the odds seemed impossible. What I've always been taught is to take risk and be bold when the situation calls for it, and this situation absolutely did. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's that's uh, that's accurate. So after we briefed the Minister of the Interior, the local governor pulled me aside because I had not been that bold in my speaking to the – when we were briefing the Minister of the Interior, there's probably over 100 people in the room, and you know I'm trying to approach this – logically, dispassionately, but also in a culturally appropriate way. And I was not as forthcoming in some of that uh, information to the large group as I was when we were in smaller uh, settings. So after that, the governor pulled me aside and said, well, what do you think the percentage of success is? It's like, well, it, it's hard to put a number on it, but I think we anywhere from 50 to 60 percent successful. I expect three to five children to die on the way out with this. But I also told him, you have no other choice, sir. Like you either get some of these kids out or you're giving them a death sentence by telling them to sit there for the next four or five months. Because that was one of the competing plans was to get food back to the kids and just let them sit there until the monsoon rains were over and the level, the water levels in the cave went down, and then they could just walk out. And we were explaining to them that, okay, to do that, let's assume that the kids are on minimum rations, as in they're on the equivalent of one MRE a day. And you're going to keep them in there for four to five months. 
and it's not just the 12 kids and the coach, but you've now got four Thai SEALs back there as well. And just doing the quick math, it was about 1,800 meals that we would have to get to them. We had already gotten about 100 meals to them, but that took a 24-hour period to do that. We knew that we didn't have 17 more 24-hour periods to be able to do that. So there's there, not only that, you're in a cave environment, which is always wet, uh, dark. We knew that if there was any sort of scrape or cut, which they probably would because they're in, it's in a rocky, jagged, limestone surrounded environment, there'd be the danger of infection. There'd be the danger of respiratory issues. Uh, any health issues that the kids would have couldn't be attended to for four or five months. We knew that the oxygen levels in the cave were degrading. And if they got down to that 10, 11, 12 percent oxygen levels in the cave, now they've lost the cognitive ability to make decisions. And they would just be, they would pass away from lack of oxygen. They'd pass away from lack of food or infection, disease. Like, you really don't have these options. So, unfortunately, we've got to go and do this. And, and they understood that. They absolutely understood that. And they were, they were finally willing to go and do it. Fast forward a little bit, um, just for sake of time here. The, the, when the last boy is rescued... Will you describe the feeling? I'm guessing that you know there had to be some relief, but yet it wasn't over yet because you still had rescuers in there. Will you describe that? Yeah, there was there was joy, elation, all around the camp, and at that point, I was actually kind of pulled out of the op center uh, because one of the senior Thai guys was telling me, "Hey, the uh, the parents of and family of the boys and the coach want to meet you guys." And up to this point, we hadn't met. Any of them yet? So oh, the I first wondered day, that. I wondered if you had interacted with them. No, uh, we had not done that. Part of it was we didn't want to bring any extra attention on them anywhere we went. There was huge media attention. The way the camp was set up, the family was normally uh, in an area that was also surrounded by a lot of media. We weren't really interested in getting any media attention at the time, and we kind of left them there. The different times we would send questions to the family, things along the lines of, you know, do you, any of your kids have any known health issues right now? How are they at swimming? What's their fear of the water? Those type things. But for the most part, we stayed, stayed separated from them. And at the end of the first day, we didn't meet with any of the family, not that we necessarily felt that we should or that, you know, our, our actions that day warranted that. And the same for the second day. But it was the third day after the 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 last four kids and the coach came out that one of the time pulled me aside and said, Hey, it's, it's time for you to go to, to meet the, the family members. And this was just the family members for the kids that were pulled out that third day. Not, not all of them. And that was, that was really gratifying. That was satisfying. We knew that we had, you know, done our best for the last couple of weeks, you know, working as many hours a day as we physically could. And, uh, it's just incredibly satisfying to, have that and they were incredibly thankful and you know lots of hugs and smiles and none of them spoke any english and once again my tie is non-existent so that was really only a five to ten minute meeting and i was thankful that it was so short because my mind was still thinking this whole entire time until that last seal comes out we're not done uh and that's something that I constantly reiterated with my guys, and they reminded me, and I reminded them, hey, this is not done until every single person is out of this cave. So we had built up a, a strong enough relationship with the the Thai Navy SEALs at that point that you know, we saw them as our brothers in arms, and we absolutely wanted those four guys to get out. So we we never said a, a sigh of relief until I <laughs> – of total relief, I should say, until those four guys walked out of the mouth of the cave. Is it not like a movie? Did the water levels not – weren't they rising and it was just <laughs> – yeah. I mean, it just barely got out or, or what? Yeah, so as the four seals are coming out, and they would go at – they would stage and come out at different times because anybody that was upstream, as they're moving, they'd kick up mud and dirt and silt and it would go downstream. And it wasn't a visibility issue. There was zero visibility in the cave, but there was so much mud and muck in the water that – we were concerned that 
it would damage the regulators on the guys that were breathing compressed air. And so we wanted there to be a good solid chunk of time, anywhere from 45 minutes to two hours in between guys coming out. Ah, uh, interesting. So, That's, I didn't know that, but I wondered why there were such long periods of time. Yeah, I mean, guys were coming out of the water, and they had mud inside their regulators. So obviously not a good thing to have on a life support item, uh, mud floating through these things. Uh, so all the kids are out. The SEALs are supposed to wait two hours. Uh, I don't know exactly how long they waited because, once again, there's no communication back there. But the SEALs start coming out. The second one obviously was much faster than the first one, or they came together because they both popped out within about five minutes of each other into Chamber 3. And once again, I'm getting notifications from my ops officer that's inside Chamber 3 through WhatsApp, and he's telling me, you know, SEAL number one, out. Five minutes later, seal number two, out. And once they get to chamber three, it's still not a cakewalk to get out. It still could take them at least an hour or more to get out of the cave, but at that point they're not really going to be on compressed air more than 10, 15 minutes going through some of these sumps. Uh, so from that perspective, once they got to chamber three, they weren't necessarily home free, but, man, they're rounding third going to going to home. Uh, but number seal number three, he pops out of the chamber, and my ops officer sends me a text on WhatsApp saying, pumps have failed, water level is rising quickly. And I sent him a text back saying, hey, that's a board criteria. We got to come out. Don't think of this as leaving your comrades behind because those guys are on compressed air. They can get out. You're not. And then I think, man, I'm not just going to do this in a text. I call him up on WhatsApp and I was like, hey, let's go. We, we got to get this. We got to get this moving. Uh, I know you don't want to leave those guys behind, but once again, they can take care of themselves. Uh, I don't want this to turn into a recovery operation for all the rescuers that, that were back there. And so they start pushing uh, gear and equipment through sump three going into chamber two, and they start going out of there uh, as fast as they can. And right after seal number three pops out, he's kind of saying, hey, wait, 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 we got, we got one more guy coming. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, he's good. He's on. He's got. He's got his air. He can keep on going, and uh, so they they exfil and Seal Four pops out right then and there. So none of our guys did leave until the last guy came, but <laughs> I was sure trying to get them to come. <laughs> so yeah, is the stuff of movies. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So I mean, how has this affected you? Uh, well, obviously this is a good mission for my. Uh, my first mission here in Squadron Command. We, uh, Julie, my wife and I, we I graduated Air Command and Staff College on June 4th of this year. On June 5th, we were on a plane to Okinawa. On June 6th, we arrived. I did turn over and in process the base and in process the squadron. And on June 15th, did my change of command. And then on June 27th, so, what's that? Eleven days later, uh, we're on a plane to Thailand to do one of the biggest rescue missions ever accomplished. So, my life's been a whirlwind since that happened, and since we came back, we've been doing media interviews and and uh, all that sort of stuff. And I'm still trying to get a handle on what it means to be a squadron commander and <laughs> take care <laughs> of the business back here. Yeah. Uh, so we've been busy, but at the same time, this is this is exactly what we train for. You know, going into a crisis and solving problems. So from that perspective, the the tactical level operation, though it was different than what we would normally do, from that perspective, it was somewhat regular. You know, that's that's what we train to do is go and link together as many entities as we can so that teamwork is strong, gather as much intelligence as we can so the knowledge of the situation is strong apply as many techniques as we can uh, so we're not just given a cookie cutter answer but we're thinking outside the box to solve problems um, from that perspective is normal but yeah it's been pretty busy the last few weeks yeah I'm sure I'm sure I I, I would love to have talked to you a few weeks ago but I don't think it could have been possible with what's going on in your life and yeah your family and also <laughs> just yeah all the demands on you but so yeah. I, I certainly thank you for making the time to let me speak with you finally, and or once I finally was able to get a hold of you. And um, did did you talk to President Trump? 
No, did not talk to President Trump. Uh, I'm sure he had bigger fish to fry. But, uh, yeah, maybe he'll get back to me later. <laughs> <laughs> I, figure, I figure he would. Yeah, well. I mean, he, did, he did send a, a tweet out at one point in time that said something, you know, congratulations on uh, getting the boys saved. So, yeah. I certainly yeah. don't expect any accolades or any uh, any credit. It was, it was my guys that uh, absolutely crushed the mission. Somebody asked me the other day, you know, what what is the lessons learned in your mind? I was like, well, you know, the the be bold, take risk thing is absolutely truthful. But a big lesson that I learned is what a lot of key leaders have told me is be willing to step back and let your guys uh, do their job because they train for it nonstop and. One big issue, issue is just you getting in the way of letting them do their job. And so I tried to have a healthy balance of giving vision and direction and left and right guidelines, but at the same time um, not getting so deep in the weeds on how the guys solve the problem that it detracts from their ability to think creatively. That's great advice. I think it's a very good leadership teaching as well in any, any leadership capacity. Yeah. Uh, what about in, in closing, Charles, anything else you'd like to say, um, maybe anything you learned or experienced or um, something that you know has, wasn't covered in the, the, all the news coverage of it? Uh, some of this was covered, but I think it uh, bears repeating. One thing that I appreciated was just how much all the separate entities were willing to come together. So we had, uh, we had entities there from the military realm, the civilian NGO realm, the civilian for-profit realm, both Thai and U.S. and international uh, diplomatic realm. And it was really fascinating to me that on a mission such as this, where the goal is to rescue the kids, and there's very little political uh, influence. There's very you, you can't come down on the side of no, we should not rescue the kids. Everybody was in the camp of yes, we need to rescue the kids. Therefore, everybody was willing to work together for this. I mean, we had we had Chinese, we had Americans, we had Australians, we had British, we had a whole host of uh, European folks, and obviously you have the tie there. For this situation, there was not any disagreement at all that the kids need to be rescued. And just with that single mindset, everybody worked together. And you can fault different people for which lines of effort they pursued, but you can't fault the overall mission because obviously it was successful. And to me, it's just a testimony to what can be accomplished with teamwork if everybody has the same vision. And I know that sounds cliche in many ways, but it was absolutely the case. And, Another thing I'd like to share is just uh, so the role of faith. I had a, an interviewer ask the other day, you know what, in this, I've only had, I think, one interviewer ask this. is like, hey, what was your perspective on that from a faith-based perspective? Uh, and that's interesting because northern Thailand, well, all of Thailand is heavily Buddhist. Interestingly enough, though, the region just around the, the Tom Long cave system and the, the Maasai region there is known for having a large contingent of Christians there. And I know I was praying absolutely every day for this to happen. There was folks that were outside the, the cave praying every day. And uh, I'm not one to espouse plurality or inclusiveness and all these type of things, but there's, there's obviously a lot of Buddhists that were praying. And I kind of notified my support system back in the States and worldwide to say, hey, I absolutely need your prayers on this. This is not something that I can do uh, by myself. So I know my home church back in uh, South Carolina was definitely sending out some prayers. I asked Julie to get everybody that she knew. And that's not normally something that I would request. Mm -hmm. uh, but, well, one, because for the operational security type reasons. I'm not normally sending out requests for whatever military operation I'm going <laughs> yeah. on. But because there was no operational security from that standpoint, we wanted everyone to know what was going on. I had no problem at all in saying, hey, absolutely uh, pray that these kids come out. And in my mind, there's an absolute definitive times throughout this rescue where if there were not some sort of divine intervention – 
then these kids wouldn't have come out. Whether that's from having the right person at the right time show up on the scene, whether that was to uh, <clears throat> have John and Rick come up at the end of their rope, literally, you know, within feet of where these kids are, uh, whether that's just supernaturally getting everybody to agree on one thing that nobody can. You know, these entities wouldn't normally ever agree on. In my mind, that there was some absolute supernatural influence. So yeah. I credited that to God. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Uh, is it true that th- there was n- the rain never ex- never got to the the forecasted points? It was forecasted much much more than they yes. were got. Okay. That that is true. So we absolutely uh, were expecting. A certain amount, and it always was a little bit less than that. Yeah, thank goodness. Yeah, yeah, well, man, what a what a just a crazy, remarkable time. Um, I was very interested. My wife was <laughs> consumed by it, and she updated me because I couldn't keep up with it. Man, then we, we we saw some of the news reports later on, and and you handled handled yourself so well. You represented your your unit well, and our nation and and so man really appreciate what you what you did and um i know you don't want to take any credit but you you showed exemplary leadership that was needed and and so man you're you're part of something that's just not going to be forgotten yeah yeah thank you